بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Last Wednesday we had discussed uh, the journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj and we had reached the place where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had been assigned the 50 salawat and then uh, if you like the descent began and the problem with as we said the descent or the problem with even most of the narration of Isra wal Mi'raj it is almost impossible to piece together the exact order of events we simply have a hadith and therefore from this point onward what we have is just a collection of incidents we don't know the exact order they occurred in and of the first uh, incidents that I will mention, we don't know chronologically which one came first. There's a very long hadith in Muslim Imam Ahmad where the Prophet mentions one incident that, that, uh, that he came across. And then there are other hadith in Bukhari and Muslim about other incidents. Of this uh, hadith in Muslim Imam Ahmad, the Prophet said, On the night that I went on Isra wal Mi'raj, I smelt a fragrance that was very sweet. And so I asked Jibreel, what is this beautiful fragrance? So Jibreel said, this is the fragrance of the one who used to comb the hair of the daughter of Fir'aun. Ma shitatu ibnati Fir'aun. The one who used to comb the hair of the daughter of Fir'aun and her children. So the fragrance is coming from her and her children. So the Prophet said, I asked Jibreel, what is their story? How come their fragrance is so strong? So Jibreel said, once when she was combing the hair of the daughter of Fir'aun, the comb fell from her hands. And she said, Bismillah. So the daughter said, surely you mean the name of my father. Because for her daughter's perspective, my father is God. And so this woman said, no, my Lord and your Lord is Allah. And the Lord of your father is Allah. So she told this girl that your father is not God, is not Allah. Rather, Allah is my Lord and your Lord and the Lord of your father. And the, the girl said, do you want me to tell my father you said this? And this woman whose name we don't even know said, yes, go ahead. And so when Fir'aun found out, he called this slave girl, because she's a servant and a slave girl, and asked her, are you saying you have a Rabb besides me? Because Fir'aun used to say, Ana al -a'la. And Fir'aun used to say, as the Quran says, Qala hal alimtu lakum ilahin ghayri. Did I ever teach you there's another God besides me? Because he has to teach his people about uh, God. And this is exactly what he asked this lady as well. Did I teach you? Did you know there's another God besides me? And so the woman said with the same bravery that she said to this young girl, she said to the Fir'aun himself, she said, yes, my Lord and your Lord is Allah. My Rabb and your Rabb is Allah. And so Fir'aun ordered that a cauldron be put of fire and it was boiled in front of her and she was told that she has to throw her own children into the fire. She has to throw her own children into the fire one by one. We don't know how many children she had. She has to throw her own children to the fire one by one or else acknowledge Fir'aun as her Rabb. And so, faced with this dilemma, faced with this dilemma, uh, she said, I have one request, O Fir'aun. Fir'aun said what? He said, that you bury me and my children all together. You take all of our flesh and bones and you bury them in one location. Don't split them up into different locations. So Fir'aun said, this is a condition that we have upon you. If that's what you want, then you will get uh, this condition fulfilled. And so one by one, her children were thrown in until finally the last one that was left was her baby that was suckling at her bosom. And this was the one that she could not, she paused at. And so the baby spoke to her own, his own mother we don't know if it's a boy or a girl, and said, Oh my mother, go forth and drop yourself in. Proceed forward. Because this punishment of this world is nothing compared to the punishment of the next. And so she threw herself in, and then Ibn Abbas commented that there were only four who spoke from 
uh, the cradle from uh, from uh, being a baby, and he said this one, and Isa when he was a baby, and the story of Juray and uh, the witness of Yusuf. This is Ibn Abbas's opinion that Shahid of Yusuf is a baby. We talked about that when we when we said the class that it doesn't seem to be. It's not a hadith. It's something that Ibn Abbas uh, derived, and Allah knows best. But that is not uh, a true uh, thing. That Shahid Yusuf is not a baby. But this hadith clearly mentions the story of Pharaoh's uh, daughters, uh, seamstress or uh, helper. And what is amazing is that Subhanallah, we don't even know her name, but the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam recorded her plight and narrated it to the Ummah, her courage and bravery, Allah had willed that it would be preserved for the Ummah. Her sacrifice, Allah had willed that the people of Fir'aun might not know of her sacrifice. But it would be remembered and mentioned by the greatest Ummah and the largest Ummah and the world would know of her story and the story of her children and she would become a role model for all of the future Muslim generations. So Allah preserved this story. And it is amazing that this story, even though it happened in the for Musa's ummah, yet it is preserved in our ummah. And the iman is, uh, of course, exemplary. And yet it is preserved in our ummah. And it is not preserved in uh, the ummah of Musa alayhi salam. Because this story is not mentioned in the Old Testament. And it's not f found in the Jewish uh, tradition and scriptures. The Prophet also said in Sahih Bukhari, that after Salah had been prescribed upon him, ثُمَّ دَخَلْتُ الْجَنَّةِ Then I entered into Jannah. Then I entered into Jannah and I saw in it tents made out of pearls and I saw that the soil of Jannah was made out of musk, which is of course uh, the most expensive perfume. We already mentioned last time that the wisdom of entering Jannah after meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is obvious and that is that the priority is to meet Allah. It is appropriate that as he is going up, he is going up directly to meet Allah. Once he meets Allah and the meeting is over, then he can go and see the other sites that Allah Azza wa had willed for him. And this is exactly what happened. That after the meeting with Allah, then all of these other incidents happen. Here we have a theological uh, question and that is, it is narrated or at least this is the interpretation of many scholars that nobody has entered Jannah since the time of Adam alayhi salam. And this is something that perhaps there's even some references in hadith literature as well. That the first person to enter Jannah uh, after Adam alayhi salam will be our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu This has been narrated in some uh, hadith. So how, the, and this is after the day of judgment is over, after the sirat, all of this, when the doors will be open for the first time. Uh, of course, as for the issue of the shaheed, a lot of people get confused. The shaheed... He is not living in Jannah. The shaheed is flying around in Jannah. Right? There's a difference between living in Jannah, occupying Jannah, versus seeing Jannah. Right? And the shaheed is not in his body in Jannah. The shaheed is in uh, the body of a green bird. And he is hanging from the chandeliers of Jannah. Right? But he's not actually in living in Jannah. So he's close, but not quite in there. This is the shaheed. The question therefore comes for the Prophet ﷺ, how, how do we interpret this? And to be honest, there is no clear-cut interpretation. One can say that the phrase, the first person to enter Jannah after Adam is our Prophet ﷺ, still applies because he entered it in Isra wal Mi'raj, and then he enters, he will enter it in Yawm al Qiyamah. So there's no contradiction that the phrase that the first person to enter Jannah after Adam will be our Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, is true. But except that he entered it once at Isra wal Mi'raj and once he will enter it, of course, for the final time, and that is after Yom al Qiyamah. And another interpretation is that uh, when he entered Jannah, he is entering it again similar to the Shaheed, i.e., looking at it, or, uh, and there are some versions of the hadith which says, Tala'atu ala al Jannah, I saw Jannah, and that's different than saying enter Jannah. Right? So to see Jannah is different than entering Jannah. So perhaps this is an uninterpretation that he didn't actually enter Jannah because there's also another uh, theological point and this is not as explicit but there is this point of whoever enters Jannah will never exit from it. Uh, especially when the, when the, the you know, uh, the, the, the hisab happens. So how then does, does one interpret the process and came in and out? Again, there is no clear-cut response. We have one of two interpretations. Firstly, it's an exception, which is possible. Secondly, he didn't actually enter, rather he surveyed Jannah. 
And this is also a plausible interpretation which is supported by some of the uh, ahadith of, uh, that mention Isra wal Mi'raj. The process, that's all he said about, by the way, of, uh, of this entering of Jannah. The Prophet also said he saw many of the punishments of hell. And this perhaps gives credence to the fact he didn't actually enter Jannah because obviously he didn't enter hell, obviously, right? So when he's describing Jannah, then he's describing hell, this looks like he's describing it as an overseer, somebody who's looking in, peering in, telling us what is in Jannah and what is in Jahannam. So this does seem to make sense that the Prophet ﷺ is basically telling us as a description of what he saw and not necessarily as somebody having entered Jannah. But if somebody were to say this, it is not uh, problematic also uh, that he entered Jannah. Of course, obviously he did not enter Audhu Billah, the fire of hell, but he saw the punishments of the fire of hell and a number of them are mentioned explicitly. And I'm putting together a lot of different narrations. Again, the Prophet ﷺ is giving many different ahadith. When I went to Isra, I saw this punishment. When I went to Isra, I saw that punishment. So I'm putting it together. This is not in one hadith that all of these punishments uh, are narrated. So in one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, I saw the punishment of the one who stole an orphan's money, who stole orphans' money, that they had noses like that of camels, disfigured, they're looking ugly, and they would be eating coals made out of fire. And their mouths would swallow these coals and it would come out through their anuses. And that's exactly what Allah says in the Quran that those who eat amwal al yatama dhulman inna ma ya'kuluna fi budunihim nara. That they're eating the fire of hell. So the Prophet said, I saw people, they were literally eating coals from Jahannam and it's going through their bodies. And these were the people who would eat orphans, uh, wealth, and property. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said in one hadith that he saw people who had nails of copper and they were scratching their bodies and their faces with this and these were the people who used to backbite all the time. Speaking of others, so their flesh will be disfigured on the day of judgment because they would disfigure the flesh of others because when you backbite, then you are uh, scarring their flesh, their honor, their prestige. So in retaliation, uh, this will be the punishment for the one who does this. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, I saw, and, and in each of these he said, he sees something, he asked Jibreel, who are these people? In each of these ones. He cannot understand. He asked Jibreel, who are they? Jibreel tells them. The Prophet ﷺ said, I saw people, they had in front of them pure meat, and they had rotten infested meat. And they were eating the rotten and infested meat and avoiding the pure meat. And I said, I, asked, I said to Jibreel, who are these people? And Jibreel said, these are the people that used to fornicate. They would leave the halal, meaning their spouses, and they would go to the haram. They would leave the halal and they would go to the haram. Uh, in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that he saw people with such large bellies that they could not stand up. They were on the ground. And uh, animals were being brought over them to trample over them as a punishment. And when he asked who they were, Jibreel said, these were the people who would get their money from riba. These are the people who get their money from riba, from interest. Uh, and of course, the connotation here is greed. And uh, the Prophet also said that uh, he saw people who were cutting their own lips and their tongues, with billah, with nails of uh, uh, scissors of copper and scissors of uh, punishment and fire. And he asked people, uh, he asked Jibreel who these people were. Jibreel said, these were the people who used to tell others to do good and they would forget themselves. And we seek Allah's refuge from being amongst such people. Uh, the Prophet also said, and I saw the Jal. And I saw the Jal and one of his eyes was bloated. One of his eyes was uh, in basically not seeing. So he is describing the Dajjal. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that I saw the Dajjal and I will tell you something about the Dajjal that no other Prophet has ever told his people and that is that his left eye is like a rotten grape. So one of his eyes is basically uh, bloated and not normal. So you look at it, you know that he's deformed. So and, uh, uh, and the Prophet ﷺ said, know that the Dajjal is A'war and A'war is one-eyed. Know that the Dajjal is A'war and A'war means he is one-eyed. These are some of the things that we hear about when the Prophet ﷺ is coming back down. 
We don't have any detailed narration as we do when he was going up. He met every single heaven. He met a, a certain prophet. We don't have any such narrations. All we have is these tidbits. We put them together and Allah knows what order it happened in. We don't know the exact order it happened in. The Prophet ﷺ came back down to Jerusalem and he then rewrote Burak. So Burak is tied up in Jerusalem, right? Remember, Burak is an animal that is for this world to transport him from Mecca to Jerusalem. As for the transportation from Jerusalem to the heavens, this is what is called Al-Mi'raj. So when he gets back down to Jerusalem, he then rides the Burak back to Medina. And there are some narrations that are not fully authentic, but there's no problem in them to affirm them as well, that the Prophet ﷺ passed by three caravans of the Quraysh that he recognized. He recognized three caravans of the Quraysh on his way back. And on one of them he recognized uh, uh, certain of the people of the Quraysh, because again everybody knows everybody in Mecca. In another one he was feeling thirsty, so he drank some of the water from the, the, the there's an urn or a public, if you like, well that, every, not a well, but a, a big canister that everybody is going to drink from in the caravan. So he just took a canister uh, from this and he drank, because this is not private property. This is where the, the large urn that the water is in. And in a third caravan he said that I saw uh, so and so, and he mentioned him by name, looking for a camel that they had lost, they could not find it. They could not find a camel, and they were searching for a camel that had been lost. So these are the three caravans that he said that he saw. When he came back to Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ went back to sleep, he said. And he woke up in the Haram. He woke up in the Haram. And this clearly shows, therefore, that the actual Isra took place from the Haram itself to Baytul Maqdis and then back to the Haram. And this is in conformity with the Quran because the Quran says, Subhanallah asra bi abdihi laylam min al masjid al harami ila al masjid al aqsa. So any report that says the Prophet was sleeping in his house or in the house of Umm Mihani, we interpret this by saying he was sleeping there, then Jibril took him to the Haram. And then from the Haram, Jibreel took him to Baytul Maqdis. Then from Baytul Maqdis, Jibreel brought him back to the Haram. So the Prophet ﷺ, the actual Isra took place from one masjid to the other masjid, from the Mecca to Jerusalem. The Prophet ﷺ, when he woke up, he himself told us the story. So this story we have in the first person. This story we have in the first person. That the Prophet ﷺ said, when I woke up the next morning, I felt an anxiety. I felt an anxiety about how am I going to tell the people of what happened to me. And this shows that Allah had told him that he has to tell the people because the Prophet ﷺ never did anything without being told. The, the, the role of the Prophet is that he has to be told what to do. He doesn't do anything of his own uh, accord. So Allah must have told him you need to tell the people. So the Prophet ﷺ said, I felt an anxiety. How am I going to tell the people and what will they say and they are going to reject me? And this shows his humanity that despite being the Prophet of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's also a human being, he feels the anxiety, he feels the stress that any of us would feel for our mundane jobs. Can you imagine the stress for his job? The stress for having to tell people about this and how are people going to uh, respond back? So he said, I woke up in the morning and I had an anxiety. How am I going to tell the people about this? And as I was sitting anxious and nervous and worried, anxious and nervous and worried, he's sitting in front of the Kaaba. Allah Azza wa Jal willed, the Prophet is saying, that the Adu Wallahi Abu Jahl Marrabiya, right? The enemy of Allah Abu Jahl passed by me and he saw me in that state. He saw me sitting anxious and worried and grief struck. Hazin. The Prophet is saying he's very sad because he knows his people are going to mock him. He's wondering, how am I going to tell the people this? And so Abu Jahl said to him in a sarcastic manner, Kal Mustahzi, what is the matter with you? Why is this? anything happened? And so the Prophet, because he cannot tell a lie, even if it's Abu Jahl, Abu the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, something happened. So Abu Jahl said, what? Hal kana min shay? What happened? So the Prophet ﷺ said, yesterday, last night, I was taken from here to Jerusalem. Usriya bi min masjid al-haram ila bayt al-maqdis. So Abu Jahl was shocked and he said, 
and you are now here amongst us, you claim to go to Jerusalem, and then you're here amongst us the next morning, you're, you're now waking up amongst us, and so uh, the Prophet himself said, he didn't know whether to make fun of me then, or to wait so that I would not retract when he called the other people, right? So he's being serious right now. Abu Jahl is being serious. The Prophet said he didn't know, should he reject me now or should he delay the rejection, you know, like to, to, to let the bait go more, to make sure the people will hear this. So uh, uh, the Prophet said, yes, I'm waking up amongst you here. So Abu Jahl said, if I call your people, meaning the Quraysh, will you tell them what you have just told me? Because if I tell them, they're not going to believe me, right? If I call the Quraysh, will you tell them exactly what you have just told me? And so the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, I will. And so Abu Jahl began screaming out to the people, Hayya ma'ashara bani Ka'b ibn Lu'ay, which is the great-grandfather of the Quraysh. Come forth, we have an announcement to make. And so the people came slowly from the places of Mecca. Mecca is a small city, as you know, and Abu Jahl is a leading figure. And when he's making this announcement, eventually the people come. And they all came and they sat down around Abu Jahl is standing there, the Prophet is sitting there, and there's this announcement, something strange. These two enemies are saying there's an announcement to be made. So the people are very curious, what is going on? And so uh, Abu Jahl says, tell them what you promised you would tell them. You promised, right? Don't go back now, right? Tell them what you just told me you promised you're going to tell them. And so the Prophet said that last night, now notice here, the Mi'raj is not mentioned, so perhaps Allah told the Prophet to mention the issue of the Isra, right? I went to Bayt al-Maqdis and I came back. And the Mi'raj he told to the Muslims later on. Uh, so last night I went to Bayt al-Maqdis uh, and uh, I went to pray in uh, the Masjid al-Aqsa, the Bayt al-Maqdis. So the people, uh, the Prophet himself is narrating this, right? The people began reacting in different ways. Some of them began musaffiq, just like clapping like in, in what is going on here. Others put their hands on their heads not knowing what to do. And others began snickering and laughing. But they didn't know what to do because he's saying it seriously, right? That he's never known to have told a lie before. So people are reacting basically in shock. What exactly to do? Until one of them said, and he had been there to Bayt al-Maqdis, can you describe it for us? Because everybody knew that the Prophet had never been to Bayt al-Maqdis, right? He's never been to Bayt al-Maqdis. So one of them who had been there put him to the test. And he said, can you describe it for us? And so the Prophet said, فَذَهَبْتُ أَنْعَتُ I began describing the Bayt al-Maqdis until they began to ask me about specifics that I wasn't able to recall, and again, this shows his humanity, that he, he is a human being. Yani he went in the middle of the night, he prayed in uh, the masjid, but the city, the streets, the souq, he went through it. But he doesn't remember every single thing, right? Imagine when you drive through a city at night, what do you actually remember of the city? And so as they began to ask him questions, the Prophet ﷺ said, Iltabasa alayya. I got confused. And again, and again and again we see his humanity. I got confused what to do. And I became so worried and anxious that I wasn't able to answer that I had never been so worried before ever. And in, uh, the word actually uh, kurba is used and kurba means terrified. It literally means terrified. I was so terrified that I wasn't able to respond, that I had never been this terrified before. Now, why is he terrified? Because this is a very legitimate question from their perspective. Can you describe the city? And from his perspective, he doesn't remember each and every detail. Somebody's going to say, where was the souq? So other, another will say, what was the tallest building? Another will say this and that. So each one is asking a question that perhaps, you know, if you really had memorized the city and you had a few days, you would know it. But the Prophet only went in at night, prayed, and then came back. He doesn't remember all of these details. And so he is now terrified. What am I going to tell them now? And he said, as I was waiting for what to respond, I saw in the distance, Baytul Maqdis rising up in front of me. Baytul Maqdis rising up in front of me. Until I saw it 
descending beyond the house of Aqil ibn Abi Talib, his cousin Aqil ibn Abi Talib, right? Uh, and this is the house that he grew up in because Abu Talib had died and Aqil is now living in it, right? So this is his house basically. No question they asked of me except that I saw the Baytul Maqdis, right? Ba basically being shown to me and I looked at them and I answered every question that they had looking at Baytul Maqdis in front of me. And of course the, the Quraysh could not see anything of this happening until Finally, one of them said, as for the descriptions of Baytul Maqdis, then of Jerusalem, then he is accurate. Everything that we've quizzed him, he seems to know. And it was at that time that, uh, and Ibn Hisham mentions this, that uh, the, the Prophet ﷺ said, I will give you some signs as well. And he mentioned the three caravans. He mentioned the first caravan is of so-and-so, and they will be returning uh, soon because they were the closest to the city. The second caravan is so and so and they had lost a camel and you can ask them about that camel they were searching for it. The third caravan is such and such and they had this urn of water that I drank from. So he described every th one of these three caravans and in the version of Ibn Hisham uh, Abu Jahl said if this is the case then the caravan should be coming if, if you saw them at such and such a place the caravan should be coming right now because it was very close to Mecca and the Prophet said I saw them at this place and while while they're discussing, the news arrives that the caravan is entering Mecca. And so Abu Jahl goes and sees and it is exactly as the Prophet described and he comes back and saying, this is clear sorcery, this is sihr, this is sorcery. They cannot respond to this. Uh, here there is a, a phrase here that has caused a lot, of, a lot of scholars some issues and problems. And the phrase occurs in Ibn Hisham only. It doesn't occur in Bukhari, Muslim or the six books of Hadith. It occurs in Ibn Hisham and it doesn't have an Isnad. And therefore, we can be a little bit lax about this phrase and say perhaps it's not accurate. Unfortunately, a lot of the translators of Sirah and authors of Sirah write this because Ibn Hisham mentions it. And this phrase says, when the news spread amongst the Muslims, some of them couldn't grasp it and they left the religion. Irtaddu. Right. Now this is problematic for a number of reasons. Most importantly, we don't have a single narration of any Muslim becoming murtad in the Meccan era. We don't have any narration of a murtad in the Meccan era. And this contradicts what we know for a fact in a hadith in Sahih Bukhari. That when in the ninth year of the Hijrah, Sorry, in the, not the ninth, seventh year of the Hijrah, seventh year of the Hijrah. When Abu Sufyan was in Jerusalem and the Prophet ﷺ wrote a letter to Heraclius, the Prophet ﷺ wrote a letter to Heraclius, Heraclius asked Abu Sufyan a series of questions about the Prophet ﷺ and his message. Abu Sufyan was not a Muslim at the time. And of the questions he asked, has anyone of his faith ever left the faith after having embraced it? And Abu Sufyan said, no, this has never happened. This hadith is in Bukhari. It's a very beautiful, long narration. We'll come to it when we talk about the letters the Prophet ﷺ sent. Heraclius asked like 20 questions to Abu Sufyan, wanting to find out who this man is. What is his message? What is his lineage? Where is he saying? Where is he coming from? All of these questions. And one of the questions was, tell me about his followers. Do they increase or decrease? They increase. Who follows him? The meek and the rich, the meek and the poor, or the rich and the nobles? No, the meek and the poor. Do his followers ever leave the faith after converting? No, they never leave the faith. And then Heraclius explains that this is the sign of a true faith. That the meek and the poor follow before the rich and the elite. That the faith increases and not decreases. And that nobody ever leaves a true faith. Right? So Abu Sufyan is saying, in the seventh year of the Hijrah, that he's never heard of a murtad. And yet here in Ibn Hisham we have, because of the story of, of Al-Isra, Hish, uh, uh, Ibn Hisham says, some people irtaddu, right? Uh, Allahu A'lam, but many of the scholars have said that because we don't have an authentic chain for this, this story should not be relied upon because it doesn't even make sense that in the Meccan era anybody would have become a, uh, a murtad. And of course it was at this time when the news reached Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, this is authentically narrated in a tabarani and in a number of books, uh, that before the Prophet could tell Abu Bakr because he was in the masjid, he woke up in the masjid, Abu Bakr is in his house. One of the Quraysh came running to Abu Bakr and said, do you know what your companion has just said? Do you know what your companion Sahibuk has just said? Said what? He said, 
Your companion claims to have gone all the way to Jerusalem, which is a month's journey, and back, which is another month's journey, and he did all of this in one night. So the Prophet ﷺ, uh, Abu Bakr said, and this shows his intelligence, he didn't say, yes, he did that. He said, if he said that, then it must be true. Because I don't know what you're saying, I don't know, maybe you're lying to me, right? If he said that, then he must be saying the truth. So the man said to him, Atusaddiquhu, do you believe him in such a claim? Atusaddiquhu fi mithli hada, you believe him in such a claim? And so Abu Bakr said, Usaddiquhu fi ma huwa a'jabu min thalik. I believe him in something that is even more amazing than this. He claims that the revelation from above the seven heavens comes to him instantaneously. Which is more amazing? Just to go to Jerusalem and come back? Or that Allah is communicating with him instantaneously? And so, فَسُمِّيَ بِذَلِكَ الصِّدِّيقَ Because of this, Abu Bakr was called As-Siddiq. From this time onward, he got the title, the laqab of Abu Bakr As-Siddiq. Abu Bakr As-Siddiq. Now we've already mentioned that Allah mentions the, the Isra in one surah and the Mi'raj in another surah. The Isra is of course mentioned in Surah Al-Isra and the Mi'raj or incidents or details of the Mi'raj are mentioned in Surah Al-Najm. And it is interesting to note that Surah Al-Isra begins with the Isra and is just one ayah, that's it. And the bulk of the surah, especially the first two pages, talks about Bani Israel and it talks about the Yehud and the transgressions of the Yehud. It's amazing that as an introduction, the Isra immediately jumps into the sanctity of Baytul Maqdis and the holiness of Baytul Maqdis. And then what is going to happen towards the end of times about Baytul Maqdis. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعَدُ الْآخِرَةِ لِيَسُوءُ وَجُوهَكُمْ وَلِيَدُخُلُ الْمَسْجِدَ كَمَا دَخَلُهُ أَوَلَ مَرَّ وَلِيُتَبِّرُ مَا عَلَوْ تَتْبِيرًا And some ulama have interpreted this verse to be something that might happen. Now, some ulama have interpreted this, that the second uh, threat might be something we are still uh, awaiting, and Allah Azza wa Jal uh, knows best. And as for Surah Al-Najm, of course it mentions issues of the, uh, of the Mi'raj. Uh, two theological questions. Firstly, did the Prophet see his Lord? Did the Prophet see Allah Jalla Jalaluhu? We have narrations from some of the Sahaba where there seems to have been some slight difference of opinion. It is narrated from Ibn Abbas in one riwayah that he said, he saw his Lord. Qad ra'ahu. And from Aisha in Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet uh, sorry, Aisha says, this hadith is in Bukhari. Aisha said, Man haddathaka anna Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ra'a rabbahu faqad a'zama ala Allahi al -firiyah. Whoever says that the Prophet ﷺ has seen his Lord has said a huge lie, a massive lie against Allah. Because Allah says in the Quran, لا تدركه الأبصار Eyes cannot encompass him. Eyes cannot encompass him. So Aisha said this and Masruq, who is one of the students of the Sahaba, was sitting there. And so Masruq sitting behind the curtain because Aisha never appeared publicly. Aisha never appeared publicly. She appeared behind the curtain or the hijab. Allah says in the Quran about the wives of the Prophet that if you're going to speak to them for anything, speak from behind a hijab. And this hijab was a hijab above and beyond what normal women have to wear. This hijab was a hijab that physically separated them from men. So the regular hijab, we all know what it is, right? But this was a level of hijab that they could not even see the, uh, the, the figure of the, 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 the mother of the believers. She has to be behind an actual curtain. Uh, and even when she went outside Aisha, she would have an actual curtain, a hawdaj, that she would put on her camel. So here in her house, she's teaching, there's a physical curtain. So Masruq is behind the curtain. And he was uh, listening with his back on the wall. And when Aisha said this, Masruq is narrating, he said, I stood up, meaning I, I went forward. And I said, Ya Ummah, my mother, allow me to ask something and don't get angry at me. Allow me to ask something and don't get angry. This hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Masruq says, didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ بِالْأُفُقِ الْمُبِينَ وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى and وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ بِالْأُفُقِ الْمُبِينَ So he quotes two ayahs in the Quran which says and he saw him 
in the highest place. And he saw him uh, and فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ adna. He was closer than two bows lengths. So Aisha responds back, SubhanAllah, my hair is standing on end because of what you're saying. In other words, I'm trembling. How dare you say that he saw Allah? I was the first person to ever ask the Prophet about these verses. Aisha is saying, I was the first person to ask the Prophet about these verses. That is Jibreel. The reference is to Jibreel. وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ بِالْأُفْقِ الْمُبِينَ فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدْنَى All of these references are to Jibreel, not to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. And then she said to Masruq, have you not read in the Quran that Allah says in the Quran that لَا تُدْرِكُهُ الْأَبْصَارِ لَا تُدْرِكُهُ الْأَبْصَارِ وَهُوَ يُدْرِكُ الْأَبْصَارِ Eyes cannot encompass him and he encompasses all eyes. It's a beautiful verse. لَا تُدْرِكُهُ الْأَبْصَارُ وَهُوَ يُدْرِكُ الْأَبْصَارِ Eyes cannot encompass him but he knows what your eyes are seeing. And he can encompass your eyes. And have you not read in the Quran, وَمَا كَانَ لِبَشْرٍ أَنْ يُكَلِّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا وَحْيًا أَوْمِ وَرَى حِجَابٍ أَوْ يُسِرَ رَسُولًا That Allah says in the Quran, it is not permissible, it is not allowed for any man to speak to Allah except it be through inspiration. Or from behind a curtain. Or an angel comes and communicates. So Allah says three things. Either I inspire directly into his heart, or he speaks from behind a curtain, or an angel comes and speaks to him. So notice here, beautiful here, that Aisha clearly knows her stuff. Aisha is quoting verses left and right. Masrukh thinks she's out, he's outwitted Aisha. He's like, come on, doesn't the Quran say he saw him? He saw him, right? وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ He saw him. So Masrukh is saying, I've read the Quran, it clearly says he saw him. Aisha is saying, been there, done that, I've talked to him directly. I know exactly what these verses refer to. And they refer to Jibreel and not to Allah. And they cannot refer to Allah because Allah says, لا تدركوا الأبصار Eyes cannot encompass him. And Allah says, no man can speak to Allah except from behind a curtain. And this is clearly proven in a hadith in a Sahih Muslim that Abu Dharr al-Ghifari radiallahu ta'ala asked him directly and this hadith in Sahih Muslim, Ya Rasulallah, hal ra'ayta rabbak? You cannot get more explicit. Did you see your Lord? Did you see your Lord? And the Prophet responded, Nurun anna arahu. Nurun anna arahu. There was light. How could I see him? There was light. How could I see him? And the scholars have said the meaning here is there was the light of Allah's hijab. There was the light of Allah's hijab because. Another hadith of Sahih Muslim says, Hijabuhu nur Hijabuhu nur Allah has a hijab of nur Allah has a hijab of nur Law kashafahu, la ahraqat subuhatu wajhihi, mantaha ilayhi basaruhu min khalqihi. If Allah were to lift this veil, then the rays that come from his face, subuhat wajhihi, subuhat means the rays, literally subuhat of the shams, is subuhat means the rays. The rays that come from his face would destroy everything that it sees, which means everything, because Allah sees everything, right? So, from this, the scholars have said that Allah Azza wa Jal, He is, of course, a type, and in his own, we, we affirm the language, and we don't affirm how. Allah says, He is Nurus Samawati Wal Ard. So Allah is Nur, and Allah's guidance is Nur, and Allah has created the Nur. All of this is the meaning of Allah, Nurus Samawati Wal Ard. Allah is Nur, and we affirm Allah is Nur. How He is Nur, we don't think. Our mind should not think. Just like we say Allah is living, but we don't think how. Allah is hearing, but we don't think how. Allah is seeing, but we don't think how. Every name or attribute, we affirm it, but we don't. We shouldn't think how. We know the Arabic meaning. We We don't think how. It's not part of our what Allah has told us to do. So Allah has said He is Nur. And that Nur is so powerful, the Prophet is saying, that it would have destroyed the whole creation. And this is proven in the Quran itself, in the story of Musa. Right? In the story of Musa. That Musa says, قَالَ رَبِّ أَنِنِي أَنظُ إِلَيْكَ And Allah says, قَالَ لَن تَرَانِي وَلَكِنْ أَنظُرِ إِلَى الْجَبَلِ فَإِنْ إِسْتَقَرَّ مَكَانَهُ فَسَوْفَ تَرَانِي فَلَمَّا تَجَلَّ رَبُّهُ لِلْجَبَلِ Allah Azza wa Jal 
lifted that veil between him and the mountain. And what happened? The Jabal collapsed. It couldn't. It couldn't. This is what's going to happen when the veil is lifted up. No creation can withstand this in this dunya. And that's why Allah says, لا تدركه الأبصار That eyes cannot encompass, eyes cannot encompass Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, in this hadith therefore, the Prophet is saying, in order to protect the creation from his magnificence, Allah has taken a veil. And the veil in our dunya is always a veil of darkness and cover. But in Allah Azza wa Jal's case, the veil itself becomes created light. The veil is light, whereas for us a veil is always covering. And so when Abu Dhar said, did you see your Lord? The response, there was light, how could I see him? And that is the light of the nur of the hijab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this also clearly shows back to our uh, talk last Wednesday that the Prophet went to a place that no other being had gone because he saw the hijab of Allah. He saw the hijab of Allah, so he said, there was light, how could I see him? Now, if somebody were to ask, how then will the creation see Allah in the next world? The response is, that next world is not a world of physical bodies that we have now. It is a different world. That next world, the resurrection will be a perfect resurrection. And it will be a resurrection of eternity. And it is not going to be of the type of flesh that we have now. It is going to be its own type of uh, existence that only Allah knows about. And in that existence, and in only in that existence, we will be able to see Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. Otherwise, in this world, this seeing is completely impossible. It's not even possible. No one has seen Allah in this world of this creation, no one has seen Allah, nor could they see Allah. And therefore, Ibn Abbas's statement, he saw him, can be interpreted that either this was a mistake from his part, uh, and, and Aisha is more knowledgeable than him because she asked directly, and Abu Dhar asked directly, or it could be that, uh, and there's one version that supports this, Ibn Abbas said, he saw him with his heart, ra'ahu biqalbihi. And this is a different type of ru'ya. It's not the ru'ya of the eyes. So if Ibn Abbas affirmed this, then it doesn't contradict the fact that nobody has seen Allah Azza wa Jal with, uh, with the eyes. Another question that was debated by some of the early scholars, and in our times it is being resurrected, is the question of whether the Prophet ﷺ went on Isra wal Mi'raj in his physical body or was it a dream? Was Isra and Miraj a dream or was it an actual journey? And the reason why uh, some of the early scholars interpreted it this way is because some of the Tabi'un, some of the students of the Sahaba, they do have narrations in which they said Isra and Miraj was a dream. And they base this on certain narrations that said that the Prophet said, I woke up, for example, in Mecca, I quoted this, I woke up in front of the Kaaba. And so with this phrase, they said, well, because he woke up, this means it must have been a dream. But the people who narrated this are only one or two in number. And it is clear that they're misinterpreting the whole incident based on one phrase. The fact of the matter is throughout medieval Islam and throughout pre-modern Islam, basically for the 1200 years in the middle, the Muslim Ummah has unanimously agreed that the Isra and Mi'raj was in body and soul, was in flesh and spirit, was in a state of wakefulness and not in a dream. And the evidences for this are too many to mention. Of them is, had the Prophet gone in a dream, what was there miraculous about him going to Jerusalem and back? We can go to the moon and come back in our dreams and nobody's gonna find this amazing. So if he had gone in a dream, why would he have found it a problem to tell the Quraysh the next day? Of them is the fact that there's a physical ride, Buraq, needing to take him to Jerusalem. For dreams, you don't need physical rides. You'll wake up uh, tomorrow in your home country, no big deal. Right? Of them is the fact that the Prophet got thirsty on the way back, he drank the water. Right? And the fact that he's drinking water clearly shows he's in a state of wakefulness. So clearly the Prophet's journey was in a state of wakefulness, body and soul, spirit and mind, all of it together. Of course in our times there have been a number of people, you know the progressives and modernists, they try to trivialize any miracle. 
they don't like any miracle because it's not scientific enough for them. And so they interpret the parting of the sea and the, everything that meant the Quran mentions as a miracle, they try to reinterpret it because they find it embarrassing that we believe in miracles. And so there are some people and there are some modern books of Sirah as well that try to state that the, the entire Isra and Mi'raj occurred in a dream. And of course it is nonsensical to say this because the whole purpose of Isra and Mi'raj then would be no point. If it's a dream, who cares? Why is it miraculous? In a dream you can go and do more than this. The whole miracle is that it was in body and in soul. So we conclude now by talking about some of the benefits of Isra and Mi'raj. Some of the benefits of Isra and Mi'raj. Realize that Isra and Mi'raj is something that is narrated in the Quran and in the mutawatir, authentic sunnah. Mutawatir means narrated by too many companions. It's not just one or two narrations. We have 40, 50 narrations about the Isra and Mi'raj. And therefore anybody who denies the Isra and Mi'raj is denying the Quran and the authentic sunnah. And that's not, um, no Muslim can do this. The explicit Quran tells us there was Isra and Mi'raj. The primary wisdom of Isra and Mi'raj is to show the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam his own status and to console him after all of the hardships that he himself had undergone. And a smaller example that helps you illustrate this point. Remember Musa Alayhi Salam's first encounter with Allah Azza wa Jal at Turi Sayna. And that's a minor example of what the Isra al Mi'raj is. That Allah spoke with him and Allah Azza wa Jal said to him, go back and tell Fir'aun, this is your message, right? And Allah Azza wa Jal told Musa that you have been given certain miracles. What are those miracles? Allah told him right then and there, throw your staff, see what happens. And put your hand into your pocket and take it out. See what's going to happen. Now, when Musa did this, who is witnessing these miracles? Who is witnessing it? No one except himself. Why are these miracles happening? What's the psychological reason of these miracles? Of who? Of Musa. Exactly. Strengthening the faith of Musa that I know this is true. Right? Yani even the prophets of Allah can help with a boost. I mean, does not Ibrahim say, Bala walakin? Doesn't Ibrahim himself say, I know, oh Allah, you can resurrect the dead, but you know, I'd like to see it, right? So that I feel content. Even Ibrahim alayhi salam, he wants, So Musa, this is his, and for our Prophet, what is, it is the greatest miracle of all, and that is, Isra wal Mi'raj. To show the Prophet that everything that you are preaching is true. That everything is real. That your Lord is communicating with you that Jannah is real, Naar is real. That the angels are like this, that you see. Min ayati rabbihil kubra. And that's exactly what Allah says. Liruriyahu min ayatina kubra. Laqad ra'a min ayati rabbihil kubra. Another really interesting point here is that this entire miracle is a personal gift from Allah to the Prophet Muhammad It's a personal gift. I mean, we don't benefit except that we believe that he went there. It's not a gift to the Ummah as much as it is a gift to him. Directly from Allah to the Prophet ﷺ. Because you see, generally miracles are meant to prove to the unbelievers the truth of the Prophet. Right? That's what a miracle is. But sometimes Allah gifts a miracle for the sake of the Prophet himself. Not to believe because he knows. وَلَكِنْ لِيَطْمَئِنَّ قَلْبِي and so this was a personal gift to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the likes of which no other Prophet had ever ever had, the likes of which no other Prophet had ever been given. Yet another point here is that this miracle and this gift occurs at a time of great sadness, and it is completely unexpected. No indication that it's going to happen. And both of these points make us understand why this is such a beautiful gift. Because when we're feeling down, right? I mean, even for us as regular mundane issues, when our friends surprise us with something, when we're feeling down, doesn't that cheer us up so much more than if something has been planned for weeks in advance and we know what's going to happen? The gift came completely unexpectedly, out of the blue. 
At a time when the Prophet ﷺ just lost his wife, just lost his uncle, had just been rejected by the people of Ta'if, is the lowest of the low at the time. And Allah blesses him with the highest of the high, and that is the direct journey to Isra wal Mi'raj. And this clearly shows us that yusra. That with every difficulty there will be ease. And the greater the difficulty, the greater the ease. And the greater the burden, the greater the gift at the end. This clearly shows us that no matter what Allah Azza wa Jal puts us through, if we remain firm and faithful, what we get back will be commensurate, proportional, or more than what we have suffered. The Prophet had to suffer so much in order to be blessed with what he was blessed with. Another uh, blessing and point of, of benefit here is that as Ibn Kathir said, the famous Ibn Kathir, the Mufassir, if any person had seen even a fraction of these miracles, he would have woke up a madman. To imagine, I mean, seeing these signs, he would have woke up yani, insane. But our Prophet ﷺ came back and went back to sleep. And this shows us the Iman that Allah Himself references. مَا زَاغَ الْبَصَرُ وَمَا طغى. The eyes did not blink. They didn't falter. That He took in all of these miracles and He took it in stride. مَا زَاغَ الْبَصَرُ وَمَا طغى. لَقَدْ رَأَى مِنْ آيَةِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى The eyes did not falter nor did they go beyond. And Allah is praising the courage of the Prophet ﷺ, praising the Iman that if anybody else had witnessed, as Ibn Kathir says, a fraction of this, he would have gone insane, woken up a madman. But our Prophet ﷺ comes back to his bed, he goes to sleep. Complete, calm, collect. And this shows us the courage and bravery of the Prophet ﷺ. And this also uh, is indicated in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ as well, uh, in Sahih Bukhari, that, لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ مَا أَعْلَمْ لَضَحِكْتُمْ قَلِيلًا وَلَبَكَيْتُمْ كَثِيرًا That if you knew what I knew, you would not be able to laugh that much and you would cry a lot. If you knew what I knew, you wouldn't be able to stand uh, your enjoyment of life. That's what he's saying. In another hadith he said, you would have left your wives in their beds, you would have left them, you couldn't even go. And you would have gone out to the, uh, the fields, you would have gone out to the deserts, meaning you would go insane. If you knew what I knew. But we don't know what he knows, and if we did know that, we would not be able to, we would not be able to uh, keep that within us. We would not keep our sanity. But the Prophet can keep his sanity. Yet another benefit that we gain here is that it shows the humanity of our Prophet. I mean, we've said this over and over again that we see the joys, the fears, the sorrows, the ups and the downs. We see that he wakes up and he is hazin. He is sad because he knows his people are going to reject him. And yet he still tells them, and that shows his bravery as well. Even if it's Abu Jahl, he'll still mention because Allah told him to say it. This also shows us the, and of course the benefit here, we don't distort the message of Islam. We don't, it's not our job, even if we're embarrassed about it, and this is a big problem that unfortunately a lot of us fall into, that we get embarrassed about what Islam says, and we want to sugarcoat it, we want to try to change it to appease the people. But that's not our job. It's not our job. Our job is to sell the product, not modify the product. And if people don't like it, it's not my fault. I didn't, it's not my product that I can change it, right? I am the salesman. I'm just teaching, uh, telling others about what my religion is. If they don't like it, I haven't, uh, it's not my problem. And so this, we benefit from this, that the Prophet ﷺ did not change or distort. What Allah told them to tell, He told. Yet another benefit we gain here, the permissibility of using physical proofs to show the truthfulness of Islam, in that when they asked Him about what Jerusalem was like, He didn't say, just believe me, don't worry about that. Rather, He began answering them. He began answering them, and when he wasn't able to answer, he felt terrified. And Allah Azza wa Jal gave him the victory by basically picking up Jerusalem for his benefit and showing it to him any direction he needed until he answered all of the questions. And this clearly shows us in our times, we may use physical evidence, whether it's miracles of the Qur'an, whether it's any other things of this nature, to prove the truthfulness of our religion. Another benefit of Isra al-Mi'raj is to link the messages of the two sons and the two great traditions of the Prophet Ibrahim, and that is Ismail and Ishaq, that 
Clearly, the Masjid al-Haram represents Ibrahim and Ismail, and the Masjid al-Aqsa represents Ishaq and his progeny. And the linkage is very clear, and the precedence is given to Mecca, because the journey begins in Mecca, and it ends in Mecca. But there is a direct linkage to Bayt al-Maqdis, that the two are not separate from one another. They are the same message. And this clearly shows us the blessings and the fadila of the Masjid al-Haram and the Masjid al-Aqsa. And this is proven especially by the first page of Surah al-Isra. In fact, the first two pages, all of it is a blessing of Bayt al-Maqdis and uh, what happened with the Yehud and what is going to happen to the uh, Yehud. And of course, this links it into the fact that uh, the Bayt al-Maqdis is something that will occupy center stage for many, many uh, incidents and, and, and things to occur and we know for a fact that uh, the Bayt al-Maqdis will be the sign, the site of the final battle as well between good and evil, between Dajjal and Masih, uh, Isa uh, al-Masih, it will be in the vicinity of Bayt al-Maqdis uh, so this will remain something that is center stage till the end of times and it was of importance in the life of the Prophet and it shall remain important as well and that is why when Umar ibn al-Khattab conquered Bayt al-Maqdis when he conquered uh, Jerusalem subhanAllah as we said the actual temple of Sulaiman had been desecrated by the Christians because the Christians were very anti-Semitic generally. They really did not like the Jews because they viewed the Jews as being people who rejected Jesus Christ, as being the rejecters of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and they felt them as basically uh, try, having tried to kill their Lord and God, right? So they had made Bayt al-Maqdis into a trash dump. They had made Bayt al-Maqdis into the junkyard of the city. The actual temple of Solomon, temple of Sulaiman. And when Umar ibn al-Khattab conquered it, he ordered that all of this junk and trash be cleansed and he built the masjid that we are now familiar with on, the, on that location. He built that masjid to purify because he knew the status of Bayt al-Maqdis. Even if the Christians did not at the time, he knew the status of Bayt al-Maqdis. And therefore he purified it and he was the one who restored the honor to Bayt al-Maqdis. Not because it's a Yahudi site, because it is an Islamic site. It is a site of Allah Azza wa Jalla having praised it in the uh, Quran. And so there is a clear connection between Jerusalem and between uh, Mecca and there is a clear connection between the tradition of Ishaq and the tradition of Ismail uh, 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 there is also a sign and some scholars have derived this as well that the Qibla will be changed as well. That the Prophet eventually uh, he, he starts from Mecca, he goes to Bayt al-Maqdis, he prays there, but then he comes back and he prays basically Fajr in the Kaaba. So there is going to be this shifting or this change from Bayt al-Maqdis to the Kaaba and this was to happen literally a year later or maxima, depending on when we say but uh, Isra occurred, maximum a year and a half to two years later, the ch change in direction came. That Bayt al-Maqdis' direction is shifted to the uh, Kaaba. Uh, in the existence of Al-Buraq and the Mi'raj and all of these creations, we clearly find that there are worlds beyond our world. And there are creations beyond our creation. Man should never think that he is the only creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, there are many other creations, many other species, many other existences that only Allah is aware of. And Allah says this in the Quran, وَيَخْلُقُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ That Allah has created what you do not uh, know. Also in the existence of Buraq, and in many other instances as well, we clearly find that Allah Azza wa Jal has linked efforts with causes. I'll clarify what I'm saying. Nothing comes for free. There must be an effort before you get your goal. In other words, you don't just sit at home and tawakkal ala Allah and you think things are going to happen. Rather, there's always an effort you need to put in to get to the goal. And even if Allah is blessing you with a miracle, there must be an effort from your part to get the miracle. So Buraq has to be mounted and saddled. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ did. To ride the Buraq to get to Baytul Maqdis and then to tie Buraq at the post that Buraq is tied upon. Right? And this is shown throughout the Quran. Uh, Maryam alayhi salam, Allah is going to bless her with fruits falling from the heavens. But those fruits, they're coming from the tree. How is Maryam going to get it? 
It doesn't just fall. You need to put in some effort. You need to do something, even if it's small. But Allah Azza wa Jalla has linked your goal with some effort you put in for it, right? And if this is for a miracle, how about the daily occurrences that are not miraculous? Allah Azza wa Jalla never gives anything like that. You need to show your dedication. You need to put in the effort to, to strive to get it. You want money? You're going to have to work for it. And Allah will give it to you. You want to be cured? You're going to have to go to the doctor and get the medicine. But Allah will give you the cure. Whatever you want, Allah Allah has created the paths to get there. Even the miracles that don't have general paths, Allah has still said, you need to do something. To part the, the Red Sea, Allah didn't just say to Musa, stand there and it's going to happen. Allah said to Musa, throw and hit your staff. You need to do something to get that, that Red Sea parted, right? All of this clearly shows uh, that Allah Azza wa Jal has created the causes and the efforts to get to the goals that you want. The goal isn't just going to come to you from the heavens. Even if it is a miracle, there must be an effort to, to, uh, that, that is put in to uh, get that miracle. In the story of the milk and the wine, we clearly see the purity of the Prophet ﷺ's soul in that even before wine has been made haram, he knows that he doesn't want wine. And he chooses the pure over the corrupt. And Jibreel says, you have chosen the pure. Had you chosen the wine, your ummah would have gone astray. And you chose the pure, and that is honey. And we talked about the difference between wine and honey. Wine, uh, uh, between wine and milk. A milk comes out pure, directly from the animal, and we drink it. Whereas, wine has to be fermented, has to become corrupt. Whatever it is, you have to basically, you know, uh, ferment it, and allow the bacteria to go and corrupt the taste. Milk serves as food and drink, and it nourishes like nothing else on earth. Wine does not nourish at all, it corrupts the mind. Wine is not nourishing, it is corrupting of the mind. And so the difference between milk and between wine is the difference between Islam and all other, and all other ways. And the Prophet ﷺ chose Islam which is pure and all other ways are corrupted and uh, evil. In uh, another uh, interesting point, uh, in one version, and I didn't mention this at the time, and it was my mistake, I should have mentioned it back then. When the Prophet ﷺ went up and he saw Adam السلام, he actually saw Adam surrounded by many, many people beyond what he could count. And on the right side of Adam was one group, on the left side another group. And when he saw Adam السلام, saw the people on, the, on his right, he was happy. And when he saw the people on the left, he began to cry. So he asked Jibreel about this and Jibreel said, these are all of the children of Adam. The Ashabul Yameen are the people of Jannah. The Ashabul Shimal are the people of Jahannam. So when he looks at the people of Jannah, he's happy. And when he looks at the people of Jahannam, he is saddened. So this is a benefit and we derive from it yet another benefit. And that is that if you think about it, in this journey of Isra wal Mi'raj, the Prophet ﷺ physically saw all of the pillars of Iman. All of them, or at least indications of them. He saw the hijab of Allah and he spoke directly with Allah. He saw numerous angels and he saw the angel Jibreel in the original form. He met all of the prophets and he spoke to them. And he spoke to them about the day of judgment. And he spoke to them about the signs of the day of judgment. And he saw heaven and hell, which are going to take place after the day of judgment. And he even saw the reality of Qadr. How? By seeing Adam with the right and the left, and by, one more thing, the pen. The writing of the pen, hearing the pen. So he physically saw the reality of Qadr as well. So if you think about it, the Iman of the Prophet after literally seeing with his own eyes all of these pillars of Iman, you understand that this was a personal gift to the Prophet to increase his own Iman. Of the benefits we gain is the brotherhood of all the Prophets, that all of them, there's no hatred, there's no animosity, they're all loving towards one another and they acknowledge the differences of their statuses. When the Prophet ﷺ led them in prayer, they all accept this because Allah has decreed it. And if this is the case with the Prophets, then who are we to deny the decree of Allah if some people are richer than us, others have higher positions than us? We should accept the decree of Allah. The Prophets have no problems accepting these decrees as well. Even in Musa crying, why did he cry? Not 
out of anger or jealousy of the Prophet, but out of mercy and love for his own ummah, because he wanted his own ummah to be the largest ummah. So he has a feeling of wanting good for his ummah. There's nothing negative against the Prophet It's positive for himself that I wanted to have the best ummah, and that's basically natural that I want to have the best good deeds, right? I want to have the best. So the competition with other people should be in hasanat and not in the worldly things. And we see this in Musa and the Prophet ﷺ that he felt uh, a positive jealousy, not a negative jealousy, that I wish I had the largest ummah. And, and Allah has willed that he has the largest uh, ummah. Of the uh, benefits that we see, clearly, and uh, we mentioned this before, the status of the Prophet ﷺ as being someone who clearly is the most chosen of the entire creation, the Sayyidu Waladi Adam, the one who leads the Prophets, the one who goes up beyond Sidr al-Muntaha, the one who sees the veil of Allah and hears the pen writing on this tablet, no other person has been there. And this is clearly of the blessings that Allah Azza wa Jal has given uh, to our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of the blessings we get from Isra wal Mi'raj is the status of Salah, and I talked about this last Wednesday as well, that no other commandment has been shown in this manner. Salah is the crux of our religion, and it is enough of an indication to show us how we got the uh, Salah. Of the blessings of Isra wal Mi'raj is the superiority of our Ummah over the Ummah of Musa. There are, many, uh, there are many theological benefits as well. Briefly, we'll just go over them, just list them. Of the bl benefits of Isra al-Miraj is that heaven and hell exist right now as we speak. Heaven and hell exist right now. Of the benefits of Isra al-Miraj, theologically benefits, is that the fitra is the purity represented by milk. And the religion of Islam is that purity. Islam fits in with our being and creation, and it does not uh, corrupt us. And there are other uh, theological benefits as well. Believe it or not, there are even some fiqh benefits. And with this will conclude, some fiqh benefits of Isra wal Mi'raj. We learn some legal rulings. First and foremost, of the legal rulings we learn, is that we need to ask permission before entering doors. Where do we get this from? <laughs> Jibreel. Knocking and asking permission. And we learn as well, that when somebody says, who is there? We respond with our names. Because Jibreel said, this is Jibreel. And not, it's me. <laughs> because even our Prophet said, don't say it's me. Right? We respond with our names. And this is a fiqh benefit we even learned from Isra al-Miraj. Because Jibreel says, this is Jibreel. Right? I am Jibreel here. And so he mentions himself by name. Of them is that the one who is walking should start the salam with the one who is sitting and standing, even if he is more noble than him. In the case of Malik as well, when the Prophet ﷺ turned around, Malik was the one who began the salam before the Prophet ﷺ could say the salams. Of the fiqh blessings here, it is allowed to and encouraged to give glad tidings and good news uh, to those who are worthy of receiving it because the prophets gave glad tidings to the Prophet ﷺ and they're telling him news about uh, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, about the signs of the Day of Judgment. Of the uh, fiqh blessings here is that it is permissible to give uh, and encourage to give advice that will bring about good for the people. In other words, ad nasiha because Musa is giving advice even though the Prophet ﷺ didn't ask for it. Musa is giving advice even though the Prophet did not ask for it. And this shows us that when there's a opportunity to help somebody, you should try to help them out. Uh, and it's a part of our religion, ad dinu nasiha we already know that. Uh, of the uh, fiqh blessings we get, uh, is that it is completely permissible to sit with your back facing the Qibla. Where do we get this from? Ibrahim salam was sitting with his back actually on Bayt al-Ma'mur. Right? And some of our cultures, in particular my culture, consider this to be impermissible, but this clearly shows us that it is uh, permissible to do so. And of the final blessing, we'll mention these are fiqh blessings, uh, and this is clearly proven in the hadith, that night traveling is actually preferred to day traveling. And the Prophet ﷺ himself said that when you are traveling, then travel at night because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the distance easier to go by. Right? Uh, and so Isra, right, is better than 
uh, doing it during the day. Isra means night travel. Uh, and this is something we can derive inc incidentally, not directly, but there are authentic hadith about this as well, that the Prophet have encouraged uh, night travel rather than uh, day travel. And of course, this is nothing wrong with day travel, but he's saying if you can choose between the two, the night travel uh, is better. And uh, obviously in those days, in the sun and whatnot, it was easier to do it when the sun had gone down. Of course, night travel means yani, after Maghrib you go to as long as you can go. This is what Isra would mean. These are some of the benefits that we get from Isra and Mi'raj. Inshallah, next Wednesday, we will start the next chapter of our seerah, and that is laying the foundations for Medina and what the Prophet ﷺ was doing during this time to think about emigrating uh, to uh, the city of Medina. That will be, inshallah, next, uh, next Wednesday. وحملته في فلكك المشحول يا من أحال النار حول خليله روحا وريحانا بقولك كون